Okay, uh, well, thank you, Laurie and Joan, for inviting me to give this presentation. And thank you, everyone, for taking a little time out of your evening to listen to what I have to say about Winter Flounder this evening. Um, I'm going to start by first introducing my co authors before I talk a bit about myself. Um, so, this overall project that I'm going to be showing you tonight is a collaboration between the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, which is where I work, and the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute, which has done the heavy lifting on the genetics portion of this project. Uh, specifically, in addition to myself from SDMF, um, we have Amanda Davis, Steve Voss, and Michael Blanco. And from GMGI, we have Tim O'Donnell and Carly McCall. One second here. Okay, so as uh, Joan mentioned, uh, I was asked to sort of talk about myself a little bit before I got into the presentation. So I thought I'd give you a quick trip down the history of my career and sort of how I wound up as a middle-aged man um, tracking winter flounder in the middle of the winter in Wakoit Bay. So I certainly had an interest in marine science since I was a little kid. I grew up in the North Shore of Massachusetts, spent a lot of time exploring tide pools and beaches, as a lot of little kids do. And so by the time I got to college, I was really interested in pursuing um, a biology degree. So I went up to Colby College in Central Maine. And by my senior year, I finally got my feet, sort of got my feet wet, um, sort of literally and figuratively in marine science. And I spent most of my winter that senior year out in the Darling Marine Center, um, tromping around mudflats, exploring the mudflat ecosystems of mid-coast Maine. And so while I was doing that for a couple of months, I was really enjoying the mudflat part of things, but I sort of found myself looking over my shoulder at the estuary and starting to wonder, well, kind of what's going on out there in the water? So after I graduated, I wound up down at Woods Hole at the MBL, and I spent most of my time at MBL actually up in the North Shore of Massachusetts, in the Plum Island estuary, getting to explore what goes on in the water just outside of those mudflats. So after a couple of years uh, up at MBL and at Plum Island, you know, I sort of got to the mouth of Plum Island Sound, started looking over the barrier beaches, started wondering, okay, well, what's out in the open ocean? What's all on the coast out here? So after a couple of years of that, I went back to grad school, found myself at UNH up in Dur um, Durham, New Hampshire. And I spent the next five or six years of my life uh, studying Atlantic bluefin tuna, which kind of range up and down the eastern seaboard, and I followed them. So I found myself in coastal waters as far north as Nova Scotia, certainly throughout New England, down to the mid-Atlantic, and as far south as the Gulf of Mexico. And as I was sort of finishing up this whirlwind tour of the eastern seaboard, I really realized at this point in my career that I, I kind of found everything interesting, from the mudflats to the estuaries all the way up to the coast. And I sort of wondered if there were any sort of jobs that might let me kind of look at all those different areas at different points in my, my trajectory of my career. And that brought me right across Buzzards Bay from where I started uh, to Bedford, Massachusetts, where I got my job with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, where I am today. And I've been there for almost 12 years now. And during those 12 years, I've had the pleasure of exploring really most of the estuaries and coastal waters that the state has to offer, doing all manner of things from tracking winter flounder, like I'm describing today, to doing bottom habitat assessments, to doing catch and release studies of TOG and so on and so forth. It's been really a great career. And so that's sort of how I've gotten to the point where I am today. Um, but that's enough about me. I want to sort of move on to the, the real star of the show tonight, which is the winter flounder, and give you just a really quick background on sort of winter flounder 101 in terms of their biology, their ecology, and how they're utilizing uh, estuaries like Wakoit Bay. So this diagram here does a really nice job of really simplifying the, the life cycle of a winter flounder. You put it in the context of Wakoit Bay and other estuaries, the general assumption for Southern New England is that these adults make their way from coastal waters into these estuaries sometime in like the late fall to early winter. Um, once they're there, they lay eggs directly on the seafloor. This is assumed to be a spawning habitat. Those eggs develop and hatch out as larvae. And for about five to six weeks, winter flounder get to sort of ex ex exist as normal fish as we'd imagine them, eyes on either side of their head, swimming around the water column, but this changes quickly. After that about a month and a half period, they make their way back down to the bottom. And during this time, they go undergo this really cool metamorphosis. And during this time, one of their eyes actually migrates. And this allows them to transform into the flatfish shape that they'll retain for the rest of their lives. Okay. So once they're on the seafloor, they basically just develop into small flounder that get bigger and bigger. From a, sort of a, a seasonal standpoint, once you're getting into the, the late spring, the presumption is that the adults make their way out of the estuaries as the water's warm into the coastal waters. And at the same time, those juveniles start to develop. And by the time you get into sort of the early summer period, they look like these um, mini flounder that you can sort of fit in the palm of your hands shown in this picture. Okay, and then the presumption is some of those fish make it and then basically they just grow and grow. And if they live long enough a year or two, they're uh, spawning adults and they sort of repeat the cycle over again. 
So to look at that same story um, from a calendar standpoint, this is what I'm going to show you here are data that were provided by the Rhode Island Division of Marine Fisheries. So down in Rhode Island, they actually monitor a few of their estuaries year round for winter flounder abundance. So in the winter months, they have pike nets set up to catch adults. And during the rest of the year, basically from the spring through the fall, they have beach seines to trap the juveniles. And what they find on a typical year is that you sort of get two peaks. So in the winter, kind of between January and February, you have this big peak of adult biomass. And as you get into June and July in the summer, that's when the young of the year uh, are most abundant. So kind of two big peaks of winter flounder in the estuarine systems. Okay, this is sort of the winter flounder management 101 slide. Um, at the moment, we assume that there are three separate stocks of winter flounder along the East Coast. So the first of these is the Georges Bank stock, which I really won't talk about at all tonight. That's an offshore stock that's assumed to just stay out in the deeper waters of Georges Bank. For the inshore area, we have a northern stock, which is the Gulf of Maine stock. And one important thing to point out in this slide, you can see the southern boundary of that stock is right on the north face of Cape Cod. And then on the south side of Cape Cod, you have what's called the Southern New England uh, Mid-Atlantic Bite stock, which again, uh, abuts Cape Cod to the, to the south. So you have basically the two stocks meeting at this Cape Cod intersection. Okay, so an important point uh, for this talk tonight is to understand that Essentially, all these estuaries in Massachusetts that we assume are functioning as winter flounder spawning habitat also function as harbors for boaters. So these can be for uh, support for commercial fishing fleets, recreational fishing fleets, as well as just recreational boaters. And to that end, for it to really function properly as a harbor, one of the key ingredients is that it maintains navigation channels that boats are able to actually get in and out of at all tides and all times of the year. And to maintain this, it's an active process. Uh, the reality is a lot of these systems need to be dredged every year, maintain those channels at depths that are deep enough for all the boats to, to come and go. So if you're thinking back to winter flounder hanging out in these estuaries, you might start to think, well, that might impact these species. So the reality is, um, you know, the dredging itself has a very obvious and intuitive impact to the dredge tract. Obviously by its nature, it's, it's tearing up the bottom, it's directly removing sand and mud from the bottom. That is the, the goal of the project. So you're gonna have an obvious impact to the dredge track. What may be less obvious is that as all the sand and mud is being churned up, you tend to create a fairly large turbidity plume like what's shown in the slide here. And all of that sand and sediment can sort of be cast fairly wide across the estuary and carpet the bottom. And this whole area can potentially impact winter flounder. Um, the reality is winter flounder are present in these estuaries almost every month of the year, some life cycle, but our assumption is that they're only really vulnerable to this activity during their early life history. So if you circle this part of the life history cycle, you start with the eggs. Obviously they can't swim and get out of the way. They're stuck on the bottom. And beyond the fact that they can't move, they're also highly sensitive to any sort of burial or environmental changes. So that's a phase we definitely wanna protect. The larvae aren't a whole lot better about getting out of the way. Yes, they're up in the water column. They can move a bit, but they really can't get out of the way of a dredge operation. And fish larvae are extremely vulnerable to environmental changes. So that's another phase we wanna protect. And that carries all the way to the phase where they settle down in the bottom and they're at this point essentially mini flounder, but they're still quite small, still quite sensitive and not highly mobile. So we're really trying to protect that entire phase of their life history from any sort of dredging activity. So one of the roles we play at MassDMF is essentially to inform the permitting process for any sort of coastal construction that goes on in the state. And our role is to tell the permitting agencies you know, what marine resources are present at a project site, what the impacts might be to those resources, and hopefully to provide some sort of guidance to stage the permitting for that project that avoids or at least minimizes the impact of those resources. Um, and when it comes to winter flounder and any sort of dredge projects, without a doubt, our main go-to avoidance mechanism is to recommend what we call time of year or toy restrictions of when the work can occur. Um, this table here shows what the current toys are for winter flounder um, for dredge projects in the state. You can see it varies a bit depending geographically where you are in Massachusetts, but it starts anywhere from mid-January to mid-February and goes as late as the end of May to the end of June, which is of course a very broad period. And it's worth pointing out our current assumptions that every estuary in the state functions as spawning habit for, habitat for winter flounder. So this time of year restriction is being imposed on any system that's being dredged in the state. And so part of the reason why these toys are so widely applied is, is what we call the precautionary approach, the precautionary principle. And this is just really a fancy way of saying that whenever there's any sort of um, attempt to avoid any sort of environmental impact, whenever there's any sort of uncertainty as to when or where that or how that impact may occur, you err on the side of caution and assume that that impact will occur. And to that end, you impose management that avoids that impact. So 
putting that all in the context of winter flounder and dredging, the two assumptions we make are sort of spatial and temporal. So again, we assume any estuary in the state could provide viable spawning habitat. We impose it on all estuaries. And then the temporal part is that any time of year when we think maybe fish might be spawning, there might be larval development and eggs, we want to protect that whole period from dredging. Okay. So you might be starting to think, well, winter flounder probably aren't the only marine species that occupy these estuaries that we might be worried about. And you're, and you're right. So we have these time of years that we impose for winter flounder, but oftentimes there's things like horseshoe crabs that tend to go into estuaries to nest on the beaches in the spring. So we want to protect the adults that are staging to spawn. There are diatomous fishes. This refers to fish species that switch between salt and fresh water for the purpose of spawning. We often want to protect them as they go into estuaries in the spring on their way to spawning grounds. And then finally, a lot of these estuaries have rich um, shellfish beds. And so we want to protect those shellfish during their most sensitive periods, which is again, when they're spawning and casting larvae out to the water column. And the reality is many estuaries have all of these resources. And in those cases, a dredge project now has maybe two months total to get all their work done. And these are in the late fall to early winter when the weather is entirely cooperative. And oftentimes it's just not possible to get the work done. Um, and so that's where the precautionary approach can kind of fail, right? So it, it's a good principle and co concept in principle, but when you can't work within the constraints of the precautionary principle, what do you do? Um, a few years ago, Mass DMF and the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance put out what's called the Port Profile Report. This is a series of reports on the various harbors across the state that looks at the economic value they have to the commercial fishing fleet. And in this report, one of the main things that was identified to, to maintaining these harbors for the commercial fleet was this problem of routine shoaling that cuts off access to get out to the fishing grounds. Um, and also routine dredging was identified as a top priority for both commercial and recreational fleets, as well as the harbor masters and all the Cape towns. And many of these constituents felt that the dredging is currently being constrained by what they think to be is sort of potentially outdated information on winter flounder presence. So the idea is that maybe these time of year restrictions are based upon outdated uh, science. And for the Fishermen's Alliance, they identified as a top priority trying to update the winter flounder research with the idea being that with better science, all of that gray area that's currently encompassed by the precautionary principle may become a little more clear, might give us a little more flexibility to have more nuance to when we impose these time of year restrictions. And to be perfectly honest, the, the critiques of the science being outdated, I have to admit, are, are fairly valid. So at the moment at MassDMF, we have, we have two main surveys that take a look at what winter flounder are doing each year. So we have a, an inshore bottom trawl survey it operates every spring and fall in Mass state waters. You can see all the red dots on the maps of Massachusetts there that show all of our sampling stations. So we do a very good job of understanding what winter flounder are doing in those seasons in the spring and the fall, but outside the estuaries. For the estuaries themselves, we have one survey that operates on the south side of the Cape in Wakoit Bay and uh, five other estuaries. So this gives us some good information on what the young of the year flounder are doing in the middle of the summer. But when it gets to this time of year uh, conflict period in this in the sort of the winter to early spring period, the honest truth is we haven't really taken a close look at mass estuaries since the 60s and the 70s. For Wakoit Bay as an example, our last major survey was done in 1967 to 1968. Um, I don't really have time tonight to go into the whole history of this, but I, I just want to make a quick sort of very retroactive plug for a, a talk that was given in the seminar back in 2015 by my colleague Vin Manfredi. And in that talk, which is available in the URL here on the, on the reserve website, he really goes through the entire history of the mass um, Massachusetts winter flounder monitoring. It's really fascinating, but a, a notable part of that talk is, is the large gap since a lot of this work was done. And so there's some reasonable questions about when are winter flounder actually in Wakoit Bay and these other Cape estuaries and harbors now, and, and how's that gonna change into the future? Because the reality is a lot has changed since we last took a look. Um, for one, there's a lot fewer winter flounder now than there were several decades ago. Spawning stock biomass is extremely low compared to historical levels, so there's a lot fewer flounder overall. And finally, the estuaries themselves have, have fundamentally changed as habitat. Um, and there's a lot of ways that they've changed, certainly with climate change and ocean warming, that's probably the most dramatic one, but you can look at other things with Wakoit Bay and other systems. There's been increases in nitrogen loading, changes in things like pH and dissolved oxygen, all these that can affect the viability of these habitats as spawning and nursery habitat. I'll give a second quick plug. This is uh, the next seminar series. I think it's in two weeks. Uh, Dr. Matthew Long is going to go on a deep dive on all these sort of environmental changes in Wakoit Bay over the past period that I'm, I'm very interested in seeing and how they relate to what we're seeing for winter flounder. 
So with all these changes I just mentioned, there have been some questions raised in the literature as to whether estuaries in Massachusetts and the rest of New England are even still functioning as winter flood spawning habitat. There's been a growing body of scientific literature over the past decade documenting spawning in coastal waters, um, suggesting that perhaps coastal waters are the dominant area for spawning rather than the estuaries. So at this point, hopefully I've convinced you all that there's a lot we don't know about winter flounder are currently doing in estuaries and a great need to understand this better. And part of the reason why we haven't really delved into this more recently is that it's, it's not an easy thing to tackle. Um, tracking winter flounder in estuaries in the middle of the winter is it's a, it's a challenging thing to do. And that brings us to the eDNA portion of the presentation. Um, so eDNA, uh, which is short for environmental DNA, is a technique that has really exploded in ecology in the past decade as a way of tracking animal uh, presence and absence and also relative abundance. And just to give you a quick understanding on what this means, so just as the name implies, environmental DNA is basically the genetic material that organisms are leaving behind um, that they're naturally casting off as they're just going about their business, living their lives. Um, this applies to all systems across the planet, but we're just focusing on aquatic ones tonight. So I want to give you a quick example of a, of a theoretical case for Wakoit Bay. So you know, if you can imagine this summer, a kid's just playing on the shoreline in Wakoit, you know, just scoops up a bucket of seawater in their pail and is playing with that. You know, they might look in that bucket and see nothing but seawater. It might be not terribly interesting, but the reality is hidden in that bucket, it's entirely possible that there might be these genetic breadcrumb trails left by all the animals in that food web that are living just off that shoreline. You can imagine there might be cormorants cruising along the surface, depositing some genetic material into the water column. That gets kicked into the bucket. Um, you might have some blue crabs crawling along the bottom. They're stirring up some of their DNA. It makes it into the bucket. Maybe some schools of silver sides, juvenile menhaden, they're cruising in the shallows. Their genetic material is getting cast off. That winds up in the bucket. Maybe a few striped bass dart in and out, feeding on those fish. Their DNA gets in there. And now you, next thing you know, you have this entire food web um, captured in this one bucket of water. But the trick is, how do you actually unlock this mystery and find all these genetic clues just from this bucket of water? And in a nutshell, the process basically involves taking that bucket and putting all of that water over a very fine filter to trap any of the particulates in that water that might be binding to these pieces of DNA. Once you have all of that DNA concentrated, you then extract the DNA from the filter. You now have a little test tube full of just nothing but DNA. You take a small amount of that DNA and you do what's called quantitative PCR to look for the DNA of a specific species of interest. And there you go, the magic of DNA. Suddenly you're able to uncover entire ecosystems without maybe even ever seeing any of these fish, crabs, or birds in the first place. So that all sounds great. It sounds a bit magical, um, and we're very excited by the potential that it offered, but we also had a healthy amount of skepticism that it would actually work. So before we went too far down this path, we asked a very simple question. Well, can you really detect winter flounder with a simple bottle of water through their eDNA? And so to answer this, we decided the best approach was to go to areas where we knew there were winter flounder, collect water there, and see if we could actually detect them. And the way that we did this was we went to Bacoit Bay and we hopped along on our beach sand survey that I mentioned earlier that happens every summer. This map of Bacoit shows uh, in the fish symbols all of our sampling stations for the sand survey. And basically all we did was we'd go kind of like that theoretical kid in that previous slide. We'd go up to the shoreline, scoop a, a liter of water, put it on ice, and then we'd go about our business, pull our seine net, count the fish, and then later, uh, the folks at GMGI would analyze those samples for winter flounder eDNA, see if they could detect it, and would see if the cases where we found flounder in the water, so we know they're present, can we detect their DNA? And the short answer is yeah. This slide has a lot going on. I'm not going to go into the weeds now. I'm more than happy to circle back in the Q&A session. But the important take home here is that all those blue dots are individual sample point. Those all reflect positive eDNA detections for winter flounder. And those are all cases where we're finding flounder in the near shore in our, in our net. So from a very simple test, it looks like the method has some promise. So with that behind us, we felt a bit more emboldened to go off and do something a lot more challenging, which was to go out to estuaries in times and places where we honestly didn't know if winter flounder were present, collect water, test for winter flounder eDNA to see if we could detect winter flounder to better understand where and when these fish actually are occurring in estuaries. So to do this, we selected Bacoit Bay and five other estuaries on the Cape. So we selected three on the north side of the Cape. Again, if you remember from the stock assessment slide, that corresponds to the Gulf of Maine stock. And these specifically were Sasuit Harbor, which is in Dennis, Wellfleet Harbor in Wellfleet, and Pamant Harbor up in Truro. And then in addition to Wakoit Bay, we selected two other sites on the south-facing side of the Cape. These again correspond to that southern New England stock, 
In addition to Wakwait, we had Green Pond just to the west in Falmouth and the Bass River to the east in Dennis and Yarmouth. From each of these systems, we selected anywhere from 10 to 13 fixed stations where we'd collect water. And the goal was to collect water every month and when possible, twice a month for 12 consecutive months. So we started this in August of 2021, carried it all the way through to July of 22. So I'm now going to walk you through what a typical field day consisted of for this entire 12 month cycle. So to follow one of these water samples from McCoy Bay, for example, all the way to the lap of GMGI, the starting point would be to simply collect the water from the bottom of the bay. So what we, we would do at each station is we would mount this uh, little pyramid frame that's shown here in the bottom. We would uh, attach one of our sample bottles to that frame, which is weighted. We would plug our sample bottle with a rubber stopper with a rope attached to it, bring the whole rig over the side. Once it got to the bottom, we'd pull that plug let the bottle fill with bottom water. And the, the logic here was that bottom water would be more likely to have winter founder DNA because that's where they spend the majority of their time. We now have a liter of water. We hold the surface, cap it, put it on ice, store it on ice for the rest of the day. At the same time, we're at that station, we'd then drop a probe down that measures various environmental characteristics. So we would measure uh, the bottom water's depth, temperature, pH, salinity, and dissolved oxygen to characterize the environment. And then we'd repeat this over the course of 12 months, we ended up collecting close to 1,000 samples. Um, but for a typical day, we'd wind up back at our lab at the end of the day with a cooler full of samples, and we'd go immediately to our lab at MassDMF, where we'd filter all of the water. Um, and so you can see this filter rig in the bottom of my picture. Each of those um, clear plastic funnel cups would contain one of our individual samples, and at the bottom of that cup is a very um, fine, pore size filter. All the water would get pulled through that filter, trapping any of the particulates that might have winter flounder DNA attached to them. That filter would then get frozen and eventually would make its way up to GMGI, which is where the real magic happens. Um, so our collaborators at GMGI eventually would get a large collection of those samples, thaw them all out, and basically they would take the filter, through a series of processes, they would extract all the DNA present on that filter, purify it, and then in the second step, they would take a smaller amount of that DNA and perform what's called quantitative PCR, in this case, looking specifically for the DNA just of winter flounder. And that translated to close to about 1,800 filters that they had to analyze. And this is still in the process, but they have done the majority of these samples at this point. Okay, so then for the next series of slides, I'm gonna walk you through some of these data and explain to you what we have seen so far. So um, this slide here shows the first month of sampling for Bacoit Bay. I'm gonna walk you through each of the 12 months that we sampled and show you the general patterns in eDNA detections. So again, we're gonna go chronologically. So we're gonna start in August of 21 and wind up all the way to July of 2022. And each of these maps is an aerial image of Bocoit Bay. Each of the symbols on the map corresponds to one of our 13 sampling stations. And the way the symbology works is if you see um, an open uh, purple triangle, mm -hmm. that means that we did not detect any winter flounder DNA at that site at that time. If you see a solid circle, there was a positive detection for winter flounder DNA. This is another case where I'm not going to get fully into the weeds now unless people want to cover it in the Q&A, but for all intents and purposes, what you can assume is that the color corresponds essentially to the relative amount of winter flounder DNA. So the colder colors, your purples and your blues, are very low detections of DNA for winter flounder. As you get up to the warmer colors, your oranges and reds, that's where you get the highest detections of winter flounder DNA. Okay, so starting with August here, this is the late summer. Our assumption would be there's still a lot of the young of the year winter flounder present, uh, but the reality is we see lots of those open triangles, so lots of non-detections, and the remaining sites are largely low detections. So not a lot of evidence of winter flounder DNA late in the summer. As we move into the fall, it becomes even more sparse. We only get detections in one of our 13 sites. We move to October, still dominated by non-detections and low detections. November, a fairly similar picture, mostly non-detections. As we move in December, we now only have one single detection across the entire bay, very little evidence of winter flounder DNA. Now, we switch over to January, which is again when that time of year restriction kicks in, things light up quite a bit. We're now mostly seeing detections, including some fairly high detections in the middle of the bay. As we move to February, the detections become even more prevalent and higher. And in March, we see a similar picture. So really from January through March, we're seeing fairly high detections. Our assumption is that corresponds with that aggregation of spotting winter flounder. We get into the spring and April and all of a sudden things shut right back down. Our interpretation here is that those adults have largely moved out of the system by this point, spawning's over. We're seeing some low detections, but for the most part, we're seeing non-detections. Now, as you go deeper into the spring, we start to see the detections pick up again. 
our interpretation here would be that we're now starting to see um, a larger biomass of those young in the year flounder that are the product of that spawning effort. As you get into the summer, in June, you see very high detections throughout the bay. Late June into early July is when we do our SANE survey. So we know there's lots of young in the year winter flounder during that time of year. And in fact, in July, we see a very similar picture. So again, really, we see these two main peaks from January through March, probably the adults, and June and July, probably the juveniles. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, we did the same analysis for five more estuaries. Way too much data to cover in a one hour or less than one hour talk this evening, but I kind of couldn't help myself from at least showing these data very quickly to you all, just to give you an idea of how the Quake Bay course kind of compares to the other estuaries in the Cape. So over the next five slides, I'm gonna show you a lot of data, over 500 samples, represents over you know, up to 57 monthly data sets, and I'm going to show you the, uh, you very quickly, but the, the important takeaway here is just very broad strokes what's going on. Don't focus on the details. Just look at the seasonal patterns and try to understand sort of the, appreciate kind of variability amongst estuaries and between the north and south side of the Cape. Okay, so we're going to start in the north side of the Cape. These are aerial images of Sisuit Harbor and Dennis. And just the two main things to point out here, again, a lot going on, but these red arrows correspond to the months when we're seeing very high ED data detections. And as you can see, from the winter standpoint, they start up in March, and they stay high all the way through the spring, summer, and into the early fall in September. The assumption here is that it's a mixture, it's starting with the adults and it transitions right away into the juveniles that carry the signal through the fall. And then in this late fall to early winter period, we see pretty low detections all the way up until March. This is Pamet Harbor in Truro, also on the north side of the Cape, it shows a fairly similar story. So again, really the, the main detections really heat up in March. We see these really high, those, these hot orange and red colors in March, and that carries all the way through the summer into the early fall and September. And then what we see here is this kind of cold period in November through January where our detections are quite low. And these sort of transitory periods in October and February, where you see the transition between high and low and low and high eDNA detections. And then finally, July, those data are still being worked on. Okay, our final site on the north side of the Cape is quite different. This is Wellfleet Harbor. Just looking at this very broadly, you see lots of purple, lots of blue, lots of non-detections. And in fact, really from the late summer, August, all the way through February, our, our system is dominated by non-detections and very low detections of DNA. Finally in March for this one month, we see one pulse of activity, but then again in April and May, it drops back down again. And then once we get into the summer, when you'd expect to see some of the young of the year flounder pop in, we do see some higher values in the inner harbor, in the outer bay, it remains pretty quiet for DNA from standpoint. Okay, switching over to the south side of the Cape, this is Green Pond and Falmouth, just west of Bukoit Bay. Uh, and here again, we see a fairly prolonged period of low eDNA detections. This starts in the late summer in August and persists all the way through December. Now here, we start to see the detections really pick up in January. We see highest detections in February, and they remain relatively high all the way through March. They drop back down again in the spring, and then we see another pulse in June Again, probably corresponding to young of the year flounder. July, we're still working on the data. And then our final system is the Bass River, which is to the east in Yarmouth at Dennis. And again, if you just look at this very broadly, you see lots of purple, lots of blue, which means very little eDNA detections. These blue arrows correspond to those the low detection periods, which correspond all the way to the late summer into the early winter in December. In January, things start to ramp up a little bit. We do see a more steady detection of eDNA. And then February and March is when we really see our, our most peak ED data detections. And then April and May, things start to ramp back down again. And then in June, we see another peak, again, probably corresponding with the end of the year abundance. Okay, so at this point, we have this year's worth of data, all 12 months, six different systems, again, upwards of a thousand samples, a ton of eDNA data. So at this point, we took a step back and thought, okay, well, we have this great data set. Um, but what are the limitations? And, and the big limitation here is that eDNA alone, um, it comes with a lot of caveats and ambiguity. So all we can really say with full confidence is that we're detecting winter flounder DNA in these samples. Two things we can't say. One we can't say is what type of winter flounder it's coming from. So is this DNA from an egg, from a larvae, from a juvenile? Is it from an adult? And if it's from an adult, is this adult just in there to feed or is it actively spawning? You can't say that just from the DNA. And furthermore, you can also ask the question of, well, where is this DNA coming from? You know, is this from a flounder that's hanging out a few feet from the sample bottle we dropped to the bottom right on station? Or is this water that's getting cast up from the other side of Bukwait Bay with the tide and we're really getting a picture of what winter flounder are doing in a totally different part of the bay? 
So we thought the next most important step, rather than doing another full on effort of sampling all these systems again, was to take a step back and take a much closer look at just one system. And the idea was to pair the eDNA data with another technique to remove a lot of this ambiguity. So if you remember one of my earlier slides, kind of the first step was to go out on the same surveys in McCoy, and the intent there was to convince ourselves that you could actually detect DNA when we knew winter flounder were there. Well, now we're sort of doing the opposite, right? So we know from the previous year's data that we're detecting winter flounder DNA. Now we want to put the nets back in the water to convince ourselves of where that DNA is actually coming from. So this winter, um, the idea was to focus on Wakoit Bay and focus on the time of year when our assumption is that fish are in the here spawning and also in the time of year when we really have these main conflicts with dredging activity. So starting in mid to late January, we went back to all of our 13 eDNA stations, which are shown here in yellow, and we also installed four fike nets. And those are the red pins shown here in McCoy Bay. The idea was to track actual catches of winter flounder that we could then later pair with our eDNA detections. And the goal here was to start this in mid-January, keep this going through the end of April, and every other week we'd go out and sample all of our stations for eDNA, and every week we'd go out and check our nets to see what we were catching for winter flounder. Okay, so this may raise the next question, what the heck is a fike net? Um, so fike nets come in different forms, but I'm going to show you in the next two slides images of what our fike nets look like and hopefully explain how they work. So the fike nets that we have have three basic parts to them. The first one is a really long net. So we have a 100 foot long net. One end is anchored right in the shoreline and then it runs out perpendicular from the shoreline into the deeper water of the bay. And as you can see in this picture, hopefully the whole top of it is lined with floats, the bottom of it is lined with chain. So it pretty much creates this vertical wall in the water column that blocks any winter flounder that are trying to make their way across parallel across the shoreline. And the hope here, or the assumption is that winter flounder sees this wall, it wants to get around it. So one option is to swim into shore. If it tries that, it's gonna go until it runs out of water, right? It's gonna run into the beach and have to turn around. Heads out to sea, it's gonna run into the second part of our trap, which are the wings. So now we have two, stretches of net made of the same material that are coming out at about 45 degree angles. And the intent of those is to basically channel the fish along our net to keep going further out to sea. And if it does that, it winds up in the trap. And the trap part, which is on the seaward end of this, it functions in a very similar way to a lobster trap. So if you're familiar with the parlors of a lobster trap, it's the same idea. They basically go through three separate chambers. They go through relatively small holes that they're able to find their way through, but not the way back out of. And at the end of the day, they wind up in the back end of the trap, which, which is where we collect them uh, when we come up to, to check our traps. This is the second slide showing similar information just from a different angle. So this is a picture of another one of our nets in McCoy looking from the seaward end and also a diagram I pulled off the internet. Um, and basically here again, that, this is a portion of that 100 foot barrier. Again, it runs all the way from where Michael's standing on the edge of the marsh, 100 feet out to sea. That's where it meets our two wings, which are spread 20 feet apart. Fish get funneled by those wings into the final trap, which is in the seaward end of the, of the whole contraption, and that's where the fish are ultimately caught. So again, we set these in mid-January, first checked them in mid-January, and have been checking them as recently as the end of last week. And the simple answer is we've been catching flounder the whole time. Our catches are not incredibly high, but they're very consistent. We've been catching flounder every week from mid-January now through uh, last week. Last Friday was the last time we checked the traps. And um, for each of these flounder that we catch, we measure them, uh, when we can identify their sex in the maturity stage, we do that as well. The fish that are large enough, 12 inches or larger, we put a conventional tag in and release them to hopefully see them recapture another day. So the nice thing is when fish, when these winter flounder are in spawning stage, it is not subtle. It's very easy to determine their sex and the reproductive state without having to cut into the animal or kill the animal. This is a perfect example here of a female that is ready to spawn. So two things to point out. In this oval here, this is the entire abdominal cavity of this fish. If you can tell from the picture, it is entirely bulging um, and distended. That's because it is full of fully hydrated eggs um, that are ready to be released. The arrow points to the vent. That's where the eggs are released. You can see it's distended. This particular fish in this picture, I can recall, was actually dropping eggs on the deck of the boat. So it is ready to spawn. All the females we've identified to date are averaging about 13.3 inches in length. The males, on the other hand, are slightly smaller. They're about 10.9 inches on average. And the way we can identify them, same idea. This arrow points to the vent. The males that are in spawning condition will actually excrete milt onto the deck when we're handling them. That's the way of easily knowing that they are what we call ripe and running. So they are mature and in spawning state and actively ready to spawn. So this is an important finding. This answers that really vague question of, are these estuaries still functioning spawning habitat? It's a very simple answer to this question that is a definitive yes. 
The other important thing to point out from what we found to date, uh, these fish are definitely not just randomly, uh, randomly distributed throughout the bay. They're very concentrated so far. So we have four fike nets. We call them fike nets A through D. If you looked at them here, this shows the percentage of our catch that comes from each of the sites. If you look at D, which is the closest to the inlet, to um, Vineyard Sound, we have not caught a single fish from that part of the bay. If you look at site A, which is on the western shore of Washburn Island and Kyle's River, that's only accounted for 8% of the catch. 15% of the catch has come from the eastern shore of the bay, sort of in the mid-bay region, um, in the eastern shore, I'm sorry, of, of Washburn Island. But the vast majority of the samples have come all the way at the head of the bay, at the far north, what we call our fike net B. That's where 77% of the fish have come from. And so just to give you a closer look at what that shoreline looks like, this is a close-up of the back end of our fike. Um, as you can see, it's a very protected um, part of the bay. A few things to point out that I think are really great. Um, it's literally in the backyard of the reserve headquarters. This beach is right down the hill from where the reserve is. Another thing to point out, it's really shallow. This is my colleague, Steve Voss, who's tending to one of the nets. Um, he's really tall, but he's not that tall. So just to give you an idea, the water he's standing in the low tide is maybe three feet deep, and that's that's the seaward end of the net. So these fish are being intercepted in the water that's probably anywhere from you know two to four feet deep, very shallow, very close to shore. And while I have this close up, just one other quick plug, um, that little white thing you see in the background, that is part of a permeable reactive barrier or PRB. And that's what Ken Foreman's talking about in next week's seminar. So if you wanna know what those are about, tune in next week. Okay, you might be wondering, uh, we have these nets set out for weeks on end. What else is swimming or crawling into them besides winter fodder? So far, the short answer is a lot of crabs. And this has been a bit of a surprise. Most of these crabs are either rock crabs. So those are the larger sort of red colored ones you see in that blue bucket or green crabs. They're sort of the olive green to brown colored ones that are smaller. But what's interesting that I can't really account for, um, I don't know the exact numbers, but probably something about 95% of the rock crabs are all males and about 95% of all the green crabs are females for reasons I, I can't really explain. In terms of fish, we haven't seen much else. We've seen a handful of Atlantic herring that have swim into our net and one northern pipefish. Otherwise, it's been a pure winter founder catch. Okay, so to sum things up, in general, what have we learned? First off, eDNA works. It's a great tool. Um, there are a lot of caveats. There should probably be an asterisk next to that exclamation point, but in broad terms, it works very well. It has a lot of potential, particularly for this particular winter founder question, but for all sorts of other questions that MassDMF has about the presence and absence and habitat use of a whole range of marine uh, fauna. But uh, we certainly have also learned that there's not a one size fits all answer to this idea of when and where winter flounder are using these estuaries. In the six systems that we have monitored, we're seeing very different patterns in where and when we're seeing winter flounder. Having said that, there are some very broad general patterns we are observing. For those three systems that we've monitored north of the Cape, our main winter peak seems to be happening mainly in, in the month of March, whereas for the southern facing estuaries, it tends to occur a bit earlier with a peak in February. For all these systems, we're typically seeing another major peak in June and July. Again, this is a presumably corresponding with when we see the highest abundance of young of the year flounder. And then finally, at least for Wakoit Bay, we can definitively say that it is functioning as spawning habitat. Now, you can't get any clearer evidence than catching fish in the bay that are actively essentially in spawning state. So, there's definitely something to be said for eDNA as this novel new tool, but there's also something to be said for the old school method, putting a net in the water and just catching fish. So we're trying to do both to improve our understanding of winter flounder. And that's my presentation for today. I do want to take a quick minute to uh, acknowledge the many agencies and people that have helped the, this work. Um, this has been an effort that's now been going on for really about five years from the time it became a concept to the point in which we have all these data. I first want to thank the Wakoit Bay Reserve for A, inviting me to speak tonight, and B, for helping with all sorts of logistics for all the different field projects we've done over the past two years. I want to thank the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, who are actually helping to fund the work that we're doing this winter, funding our, our seasonal technician who's helping with a lot of this work, Michael Blanco. I also wanted to thank Vin Manfredi and Rich Beloskis. Uh, they work for MassDMF and Rhode Island DEM, respectively, and they've been really patient letting me tag along in all their surveys and grabbing water in between all of their, their winter founder work. Uh, in addition to that, there's a whole host of people who've helped out both in the field and the lab to get all these samples processed. And uh, that's it. So with that, I will take any questions and happy to talk more about winter flounder, eDNA, um, whatever you want to cover. So thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of questions. Laura, you want to start us off with the first question now? Sure, I'd be happy to. That was great. Um, I think the First question I'm going to ask is, how long can the winter flounder DNA last in the environment? 
It's a really good question. So we can't, I don't have an exact answer. The typical assumption for finfish is anywhere from probably 24 to 48 hours. Uh, with, with loads of caveats with eDNA, right? So there are a lot of variables that are going to drive that, right? So certainly water temperature is going to be a factor, um, you know, where that DNA is deposited, what the flow is, what the tidal exchange is for how much it's diluted. But our assumption is that the samples we're collecting here is reflecting kind of what's been going on for the past, you know, day to two in terms of winter flounder distribution. Great. Uh, here's one from Nancy. What do the percentages translate to in terms of numbers and uncertainty measurements statistics? So I'm assuming she's referring to the percentages of the pike catches, or is she referring to the eDNA percentages? Maybe she could clarify, because both of those are in my slides and relatively ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see, she put it in the chat, or you could unmute yourself if you want to answer that, Nancy. Nancy, if you're still on, you're welcome to clarify. If she doesn't, I can answer both, because they're probably both good questions. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so I'll start with the eDNA. Um, maybe I'll, let's see, I'll toggle back to that slide. Hold on. Bear with me. One of those where I showed the scale. Oh, it's way back. Um, so yeah, well, this is fine. This is a good example. So when I show these colored circles of eDNA, they're percentages, right? Now, what that means, I, I said in the talk that it, it basically correlates with the relative amount of DNA. And so when GMGI is doing all of their lab work, for a given sample, when they do that qPCR, they're not just doing one sample, they're doing a number of replicates. So they're testing for the eDNA detections, I think it's typically six times per filter. And so what that percentage is, is the percentage of those replicates that comes back positive for winter flounder DNA. And the reason that that basically correlates with the amount of DNA is if you can imagine, if there's very little DNA in that sample, your odds of getting a blank in any given run are higher. So for the really low detections, you're going to get a higher percentage of non-detections, which translates to a lower percentage on the scale. If there's a lot of DNA in the sample, you have a more like greater likelihood of great, having greater replication of positive detections across all your replicates. So... And if you're wondering why we're presenting it that way, as opposed to just the total amount of DNA, um, that works too. What becomes a little tricky with these samples is we don't always put all of that water from a sample onto a single filter. As you can imagine, um, as you get into the summer months when there's a lot more stuff in the water, uh, you really can't put a whole liter of water across a single filter. So we end up having to split the samples into multiple filters. As a result, you change the number of replicate, uh, replicates in the PCR across samples. So to standardize for that, we just put everything as a percentage. So hopefully that answers the first question, if that was your question. Um, and the second question, if it was your question about the pike net percentages, um, again, the catches aren't terribly low. Um, those percentages are literally the, the percentage of the total number of winter flounder caught to date. I want to say our total tally for all systems in the you know month and a half we've been doing this is probably about 30 fish. So it's not a ton of fish, but it's very consistent. We're getting, you know, uh, each time we check our nets, we're probably getting about three to four fish per, per check. So. Hope that answers those questions. Okay, thanks, John. Yeah. 100% relative to what, so? 100%, uh, yeah, so that means, so say for example, there were six replicates, all six would have positive detections. But again, there could be cases where you have 14 replicates because that sample has been split twice, right? So you're doing that qPCR on six, six times on each, because the, the qPCR is done on a per filter basis. So if the sample gets split into multiple filters, each of those filters gets um, the same number of replicates. So when I say 100%, it means all of the all of the uh, replicate qPCRs came back positive for winter flounder DNA. Hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. And she said, how do you calculate errors? <laughs> gotcha, she said. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but right. in terms of the error question, okay. there, there is a certain minimum detection threshold. All and right. so once it's above that, we, it's considered a positive detection. So. All right. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, let's see, what, what are the interaction between benthic water temperature and sediment type on winter flounder spawning site locations, time and space? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is we, we don't know. The data just aren't there. I, I mean, people have looked at spawning habitat. Um, in terms of temperature, the, the general assumption is that the trigger for them to spawn is kind of when the temperature reaches its coldest point and it starts to warm back up again. So for this part of Massachusetts, it's assumed that when it's around zero degrees Celsius, thereabouts, and it starts to warm back up, that's kind of their signal to start spawning. So that's sort of the, the bottom temperature part of that. In terms of the sediment type, I mean, the reality is uh, eggs have been detected in, in a whole range of sediment types. Uh, 
it really is presumed that in these estuaries, it's really the shallow protected areas, but they've seen it, you know, it's usually more in the standing habitat, but you, you know, eggs have been found also in the muddier habitats and vegetated and unvegetated. It's kind of a mishmash. Temp but temperature seems to be the main cue for when they, when they, when they spawn. All right, the, uh, the next question is, how do your observations compare to those of the commercial fishing fleet? Yeah, I mean, well, I wouldn't just leave this to the commercial fishing fleet. I would say the commercial fleet, as well as a lot of other stakeholders, um, be it harbor masters or other uh, people using these estuaries, particularly people with um, that are older that have, have sort of been around these areas for a long time. The general assumption is that, again, which is true, there's a lot fewer flounder than there used to be, but I think people have pushed that to the extreme of just assuming that there just aren't flounder in these systems anymore, you know. Um, you hear lots of anecdotes from either commercial fishermen or just recreational fishermen about being able to go into these estuaries back in the day in the middle of the winter and fish off ridges and, and fill up a five gallon bucket with winter flounder. No one's doing that anymore. Again, there are far fewer fish. Um, so I, I think maybe the, the, the difference in the perception of commercial fishermen and, and other kind of locals is that there's no fish, whereas our, our understanding is that there are, there's fewer fish than there used to be, but there, there still are some fish in these systems. So I, I think that's sort of where, where the differences lie. Okay. Um, from Caitlin, do you plan to repeat a similar FikeNet survey on the North shore of the Cape? That's a good question. I'd like to, so the one thing about FikeNets um, is you can't just install them anywhere. Um, and one of the reasons we chose McCoy, we chose there are multiple reasons. One, honestly, all the reserve research going on in the background is really useful. Um, but part of it too is you need the right shoreline for the nets to work. So as you can recall, they they run out, the, the main net's only 100 feet long, and then your, your trap is just beyond that. You need to have a, a shoreline that's deep enough where that is that net is kept underwater at all times. So if you think about some of the systems we looked at, um, particularly Wellfleet Harbor that has really extensive flats, it wouldn't work there. Your whole net would be high and dry at low tide. Um, that's probably true in Hammett. It might be true in Sasuit, but yes, I'd like to. I mean, I certainly, I would say Sasuit or Pammon, if we could get to one of those systems, you know, where we're seeing all these really high DNA detections, I would love to have some sort of validation of what that DNA is tied to. So maybe, um, I, I think next year we'll definitely have fikes in the water, whether it's repeating in McCoyt, and or maybe trying to spread further abroad to the north side of the Cape, it, that remains to be determined, but I think they're a really useful tool. So, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, all right, uh, question, is this now at the level that it can be used to modify WFPOYs? No, <laughs> so um, it's definitely not ready for prime time, um, but I will say, you know, I'll, I'll start this answer by saying I was this, this approach is biggest skeptic when I started, you know, I saw the potential, but I also saw all the limitations. And you know, when I presented this to the stakeholders, to harbor masters using these systems, I presented what we we're going to do, and I was very upfront that you know, what we might find after a year is that it just doesn't work for this approach. Um, after a year, I think it definitely does work for this approach. I think ultimately it's going to be our main tool for getting to those decisions. But I would never make a management decision, regardless of what we saw, based upon one year of data. I mean. I'm really curious to see what we find when, when we analyze the results we're collecting right now in McCoy, because as you know, this winter has been entirely different than last winter. Um, can we rely on one year to say, okay, March is the year that all the fish move in? Probably not, right? It's, it's a year to year thing, uh, but we're getting there for sure. I, I think this is gonna be a tool that ultimately will allow us to have a lot more nuances in where and when we apply the time of year restrictions. And the other part of this right now, you know, as, as I pointed out earlier in the talk, Basically, this precautionary approach, it fails every year. There's going to be cases every year where there's a system that's shoaled in. It has to be dredged for navigation purposes. The work can't get done within this time of year window. And we have to make really hard decisions on when and where to let that happen without a lot of great science. And so this, this eDNA is going to help with that process as well. So I would say um, hold tight. <laughs> Give us a little more time. Yeah. Great. Thanks, John. We have a few more questions. Sure. Are there measures that might be taken by marine fisheries or other agencies to protect the flounder spawning habitats in McCoy Bay? Yeah, that's a good question. I do think that this, this toy approach in terms of any sort of coastal construction, it's a good one from a, a temporal impact standpoint. Um, but, you know, again, I, I alluded to that talk that's going to happen in two weeks that Matthew Long's giving. I mean, it's hard to know what all these changes in the estuaries are doing to this habitat, this winter flounder habitat. But one thing we're seeing, you know, in some of these sites, we're seeing the eDNA peaks in the winter that shows the fish probably are spawning there, but we're really not seeing the corresponding peaks in the summer when you expect to see this great recruitment of the young of the year. And it does raise the question of whether these systems 
you know, sure, maybe fish are still spawning there, but maybe the actual habitat really isn't all that great as nursery habitat for winter flounder. You know, why could that be? You know, things like that, poor water quality. If there's periods where there's anoxia near the bottom layer, which is driven by things like excessive nutrients and nitrogen loading, uh, that can be a part of the problem, right? So I think sort of the things that we're always looking for to improve these systems with best management practices to reduce nitrogen loading, to, to improve water quality, I have to assume that would have um, positive effects on winter flounder as well. So I think, you know, from a construction management standpoint, I think the big approach is to minimize this work still like we're doing when we when fish are spawning and when larval development's happening. But there's a whole other piece of improving the habitat itself to make sure that it actually is functioning as nursery habitat for these fish once they've been allowed to spawn. So, yeah. Uh, here's one. Were there any dredging projects going on during any of these monitoring efforts? That's a good question. Um, yes. So Pamet Harbor, uh, the inlet channel to Pamet Harbor, they were finishing up that work. I can't remember offhand. I can picture the dredge rig and it being very cold, um, but that's all I can remember off the top of my head. But that's one instance. So that was one case where they were finishing up a dredge operation. Um, probably there's probably late fall, right before the time of year kicked in. Um, but that was the only example, and it's worth pointing out, uh, you know, at the entrance, the inlet channels, that's right where the jetties are, where the, where the harbor meets the open ocean. That's not an area where we'd expect spawning to happen. So dredging there might be um, maybe inhibiting fish moving in and out to stage to spawn, but it's probably not going to be having any impacts on the founder themselves. Again, uh, in terms of the permit conditions, really any project that's trying to dredge inside any of these estuaries is going to have one of those time of years keeping them from happening. And it's very rare that we make exceptions to allow work to happen within the what we call the embayment, which is inside the estuary during that time of year window. So no, we didn't see any dredging happening in the area that we would assume to be spawning habitat. Uh, maybe this could be a quick one. Do the, do the flounders spawn on Child's River? <laughs> well, um, that's a good question. So we do have one fike net in the Child's River. We do also do have ETNA stations. I forget the number offhand already. I think it was 8%. So we have caught some flounder that are in spawning condition in the Child's River. And I can say from our, um, anecdotally from the same survey that's done every summer, we often get our highest catches on the Child's River side of Washburn Island. So yes, I, I presume that those fish are coming from fish spawn in the Child's River. So yes. All right. And I think we have one more question that'll bring us to 7.30. Okay. Uh, can detection of eDNA differences between estuaries be related to how much an estuaries flush daily? That's a great question. So again, many caveats, not enough time to get into all of them. Um, I would say the answer is yes. So uh, one thing to point out for anyone that's familiar with the six systems we picked, they are quite different in size and also in flushing rates. So Look at the north side of the Cape, that's the most conspicuous difference in my opinion. So you have Wellfleet Harbor, which is, you know, it's a harbor, but really it's an open bay, uh, a natural open bay with a ton of flushing with Cape Cod Bay, whereas the Seward Harbor and Pamet Harbor are, are much smaller in scale. And their only connection to the Cape Cod Bay is a very small man, uh, you know, human made inlet that allows more limited flushing. So yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, one of my many questions is, is to what extent is there a potential, um, A, that we're getting flounder DNA that's washing in from the ocean and also that we're losing DNA that is flushing out? I mean, the one thing we did do to standardize the survey, we do standardize when we collect the samples. They're all collected right around low tides, or at least there's not variability in the tidal stage when we're collecting. But nonetheless, this water is moving in and out of these estuaries, you know, with every tidal cycle. And so, yeah, that's a really good question. That's a potential for either loss of DNA or influx of DNA from other areas. So that's one of the, in my opinion, perhaps the biggest challenge with interpreting eDNA data in a, you know, an estuary or a coastal system. Well, that that was an excellent presentation. You're getting lots of compliments in the chat box.